Uh, well, good afternoon, Council. Uh, it is a uh, few minutes after one o'clock on Tuesday, December 7th, and we are meeting uh, here at the Corbett Park Hall in person. So we'll proceed now with the adoption of the agenda. Okay. I require a mover and a seconder, moved by Councillor Kelly and seconded by Councillor Lockheed, that the draft agenda presented to Council for the special meeting and dated the 7th of December be here by adopted and circulated. All in favor? Carried. Thank you so much. Disclosure of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof. There being none, we will proceed. Today we have one item on our agenda, and it is the final review of the comprehensive zoning bylaw. And the intention is following this meeting for it to be brought to council next week on Tuesday, December 14th for final approval. And so we turn it over to uh, uh, the manager of uh, uh, planning uh, to provide us with uh, an overview and to lead us in the discussion, final discussion. Thank you so much. Good. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rushford. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, so as Mayor Rushford uh, explained, we're, we're going to be doing a, a final review of the new conference of zoning bylaw documents today. Uh, so just, just a bit of background, uh, since the last time uh, we met with Council on this, uh, we have had our, uh, our final uh, Planning Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, so that was our, our second uh, statutory meeting under the Planning Act. Uh, so at that meeting, we, uh, we went through the rest of the, the, rest of the draft bylaw. Uh, we received public comment again and, uh, and a few recommendations for changes to the bylaw. Um, so I think um, I think what I'd like to do today is uh, to pick up where we left off at our last council session in November, and I'll provide council with an overview of uh, the changes that have been made to the bylaw uh, since our last council session. So that that would be based on the feedback we received uh, from you at our last session, uh, also from the planning advisory committee, and also from public comment. Uh, so we'll we'll go over those changes. Uh, and then I'll go over the planning committee recommendation that, uh, that was made at our, at our December 1st meeting. Uh, and then and then we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. Uh, we also do have the opportunity to make uh, any additional recommendations or changes uh, at today's meeting uh, that can be incorporated into the bylaw that, uh, that will be coming before you next week on, uh, on the 14th. Um, so uh, are there any general questions before I, uh, Start the process. Okay, uh, seeing none. So I'll uh, I'll jump right into uh, into the changes that uh, that we discussed. Uh, so 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 we got through all of the major changes at our last council session uh, and highlighted some of the major topics like short term rental, second units, uh, some of the different late fund stuff. Um, so so since that meeting, uh, we. We made a few uh, a few changes um, at our planning, planning advisory committee meeting. Uh, so I'm just going to go through them. There's about 15 of them, and, uh, and this is the only, or these are the only new items since since our last meeting with uh, with you. So I'll go through them one by one, and if we have any questions, uh, we can talk about the, the rationale for them and then why we made those changes. Uh, so the first thing that we had, uh, that we had changed was uh, we. We discussed bunk keys, uh, so a bunk key being, uh, being defined as an accessory structure on a lakefront property primarily that's uh, it's used for sleeping, uh, but not a second unit. Uh, so at the planning advisory committee um, uh, level, we uh, we discussed whether whether bunk keys should be regulated uh, additionally beyond our second unit policies or, or other things like that. Uh, the concern was that uh, since our official plan uh, regulates second units, and um, and doesn't permit uh, that type of additional kind of like rent like rental unit in, in the lakefront area. Then maybe bunk use should also be restricted. Uh, the idea being you don't start to have accommodations for for multiple people. Uh, so as a result of that recommendation from the planning advisory committee, we we added a definition for bunky and uh, and excluded them from permission from lakefront zones. Uh, so that was the first change. Uh, uh, another lakefront zone chain was, uh, or lakefront related rather, uh, was the merging of the resort residential and the lakefront residential zones. Uh, so this is something we touched on at our last council meeting briefly, but uh, 
the, the historical purpose of those two zones was to differentiate seasonal accommodation versus permanent accommodations. And, uh, and we basically uh, we basically found that that was kind of a, a redundant distinction to make, uh, given that other things like building code uh, don't don't differentiate between seasonal versus permanent. Uh, similar regulations at the provincial level apply in all cases. Uh, so we merged those. Um, another thing that came up was uh, was boathouses. So I, I know there's been some conversation about uh, about boathouses and, uh, and you know whether they they should be allowed or what their, their role may play in, uh, in the lakefront areas. Um, our official plan does say that we will allow them. So what we talked about was was how can we make sure that boathouses aren't going to uh, cause like either a visual eyesore or like alter the, the characteristic of the lakefront areas. Uh, so the planning committee uh, made the recommendation that we that we implement a couple of uh, I guess like regulatory measures to ensure that both houses don't become too large and, and especially don't allow a second story uh, either living space or uh, or like decks that could be used as you know kind of party areas. Uh, which uh, the, the whole idea is to to not allow development in a way that you see on some areas in Muskoka, you know, big uh, kind of. Party boathouses, for lack of a better word. Yes, just a question. Yes. Uh, you're talking about boathouses that are attached to the, uh, to the ground or the ones that are free in the water? So we are talking about, um, we're talking about all boathouses. Uh, when they're not attached to the ground, we do have difficulty regulating them because of the way that zone bylaws uh, are only allowed to regulate uh, structures that are actually on the ground in the municipality. So our ability to regulate things that are floating on the water uh, is is very limited. It's um, it's a bit of a gray area in, in the kind of relationship between the municipal, provincial, and federal governments as far as regulation goes. Uh, so we we intend to do our best to apply these regulations to all boat houses where possible. But sometimes we legally don't have the right to do that when it comes to a floating structure. So technically, you're telling me something called both house that's not attached to ground. Could have a second story or nothing to do with it. Pretty much, yeah. Can I ask another question on that? The, the boat houses that are not attached to the ground do, are anchored into the, the, the bottom of the, uh, of the lake, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that not ground? Uh, that, in a sense, I mean, it's interesting when there's uh, water. You know, uh, sometimes the water uh, recedes or. Mm -hmm. but it falls under the who owns the lakeshore roads. Not exactly. It's uh, it it depends on what percentage of the boathouse itself is anchored to the to the lake lake bottom, uh, and, and in most cases it doesn't meet that threshold because most people are anchoring them with with like large post construction, and and it needs to be a certain percentage. Uh, the exact percentage I don't have offhand, but it does require a certain uh, percentage of the floor area of the boat has to be physically anchored with like cribbing or, or other like structural supports and anything built with a post op construction will never cross that threshold. Um, this uh, this is a similar scenario to uh, the boat house that, that was discussed previously on Lake Osmondson that was floating uh, and, and that was out, outside of our uh, regulatory or regulatory authority. Uh, there are are requirements for building permits to be issued, which do be, get issued by us, uh, but our zoning laws cannot apply. The reason that Mayor Russia was saying that it's, if it's anchored and the ground is away from the ground, mm -hmm. if they own the Lakeshore Road lines, they actually will own that piece of land that's underneath it. But if they don't own it, it's owned by the municipality. Uh, yes, but as soon as it's part of the lake, it doesn't matter if ownership extends into the lake. The regulatory control still falls under DFO and MRF or, or NDM and MRF now. Uh, but uh, but the permitting authority is very unclear as to how that works. We, we explored that when we had the, the boat house on Lake Osmondson earlier in the year, and uh, and the conservation authority does play a role. Uh, but uh, but it, it seems to very much depend on a case by case circumstance as, as to how those get regulated. Uh, so our intention going forward is to is to apply our, our zoning bylaw regulations uh, if possible. Um, I, I just wanted to make council aware that uh, 
uh, if it really, you know, if push comes to shove, it may not be possible for us to legally uphold these regulations. But but we do plan on on trying our best to ensure that these apply to all boat houses, floating or not. Like this at the end of the day, it's, it's still not black and white. It's just like it's gray area. It is a bit of a gray area. So it would be an area for us to advocate for a clarity and for support of our zoning bylaw. Hmm. Our zoning bylaw, yeah, our zoning bylaw can only regulate land. That much is very clear in the legislation, but uh, but we definitely could uh, advocate for more clear direction um, at the provincial and federal level when it comes to on water structures. That's something we could definitely pursue in the year. Because I guess it's going to change. Like there's less property that you can buy in the market. There's less room to put a boathouse. You see one, you're going to see, start seeing more. So you set up residence, and it's going to keep going. Wait, I understand Just, already. There's a there's some that are under discussion. So to your point exactly, and, and it, the way I find that it would be important to sort of try to, to regulate to some extent. I mean, I, I find, I, I, I just mentioned, I just personally, uh, you know, I know I've mentioned that before, that uh, there was this impression out in our community that boat houses weren't allowed. And we really have, I find the shoreline, um, especially I think on Lake Wisconsin, I think that may be true, and even to some extent, Trout Lake, that is not populated by boat houses as a result of that. And I think it, it's a, personally, I think it's a good thing overall. But that said, uh, if we can regulate the sides, I think that that's wonderful the direction we take it. But I would, it would be good to carry it forward to also on water. So if we're able to take further steps down the road, that would be a good position. Just want to knock. Another option would be just to not have them. I'm just saying, like, um, no, the, only, the only thing about not having them is that our official plan says that we will put in policies to regulate them. So we need okay. to draft zoning policies that follow our official plan. Fair, fair. Okay. That's the reason why I was asking. So it's great here. So that's um, that's part of the reason why we uh, we looked at, at ways that we could regulate them by further reducing the floor area compared to normal structures, as well as further reducing the height. Um, and then we also put in uh, a proposed uh, slope for the roof of between 15 and 35 uh, percent. So that, um, that that basically gives a range of, uh, of standard low profile uh, roof slopes. Uh, the idea with that was that you're not going to have a large roof structure that could have you know more of a visual impact for neighbors and then also the four meter height rather than six meter just shrinks everything down a little bit. Uh, that being said, uh, we could further reduce that. So, so part of the idea of today's session is to get council's feedback on some of the recommendations from the planning committee. And uh, and if um, you, you know if there's a feeling that could be should be to be further reduced, that that's certainly something that we can do before bringing it back to to council at the next uh, next meeting. Well, I agree with that. Really, that the council was saying too is make a size of a board for a board, not any bigger. That's the reason yeah, it's a board. Yeah, it's a board. We can't say uh, what came up? <clears throat> what came up at uh, the planning board meeting was, uh, and something I saw firsthand on uh, the Cottage Life Channel last year, is the Muskoka. You can't see the shoreline anymore yeah. on Lake Muskoka and Lake Joseph because these boat houses are homes. Yeah. They have living quarters. They have sleeping quarters. I mean, uh, they even have uh, uh, showers in the whole bit. I mean, they're basically a home on the water in addition to the house that's on the property. Mm -hmm. And that's because we had a couple of people that were on uh, from the planning board went through Lake Muskoka, can't see the shoreline, and the neighbors sure as heck can't see the water at times. Mm -hmm. So it obstructs it. So it's good to have regulations and uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily that stringent, but I think there should be some limitations. That was a, basically, that was the gist of uh, what the committee is looking for. It was, yeah. Um, maybe I'll give a full overview of what our current regulations or what our proposed regulations that were passed by the planning committee for both houses are, so we can discuss them. Uh, so we we had added additional provisions relating to the maximum width of a boat house. So it said that uh, your boat house along the frontage can be no no wider than eight meters, uh, which is fairly generous, uh, and, and it would mean that you would have a fairly narrow boat house um, this way to, to meet the area requirements, but. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, we said that you have to have a minimum lot frontage of 30 meters. So basically existing lots that have less than 30 meters uh, would be deemed to not be wide enough to accommodate a boathouse um, because of trying to discourage that density of boathouse, 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 all you know, next to each other. 
Uh, and then additionally, you'd require a 4.5 meter setback from each of your side property lines. Uh, you would be limited to four meters in height, and you would be limited to 45 square meters of ground floor area, uh, which is approximately square or 500 square feet. Uh, and to put that in perspective, our uh, our um, mi minimum, like our lowest possible normal accessory structure uh, maximum area is uh, 960 square feet. So it's approximately half of the smallest regulation for a normal accessory structure. Uh, so, so the intention is definitely to make sure that they're uh, smaller, uh, shorter, and um, and like less assuming in general than, than a normal garage or or other accessory structure. Um, if if you know if, if an amendment um, was desired, I think maybe some of the best things to take a look at might be the maximum width. Um, maybe maybe shrinking the width along the shoreline might be an additional measure that would help prevent uh, the appearance of you know dominating the shoreline. Mm -hmm. At twenty five feet wide, it's quite wide, in my opinion. Well, yes, and certainly I, knew, I was just going to say in today's day and age, everyone seems to have four houses that are very large, and uh, we'll probably aim to get the largest uh, footage or size possible. And yeah, that's it. So, yeah. Well, if you not to harp on this, if you make it as small as possible, we can always come in and ask for a, a, a lot of larger or a boat of large, but when you look at every everyone different. Because some of them you may have all kinds of room to do it, some of you may not. Yeah, absolutely. So, so every every provision in here is always subject to the potential for a minor variance if there's a situation that warrants an exemption. So it could be looked at through a minor variance. Um, the the intention with the meter width was that uh, was to give flexibility in case someone wanted a side loaded boathouse if it made sense for their lot. Uh, because sometimes if you have a lot that has a bit of a point or something. Uh, and depending on shoreline conditions, it may uh, make sense to come in from the side. Uh, and that's why it's wider. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, most, most you know, use of a boathouse is going to be straight in, straight out. So if we wanted to shrink it, that, that could work. And we would just be making the assumption that, that all boats would be coming you know, vertically in and out. Uh, because with the maximum width of eight meters, uh, to, to build that to the maximum width, but still meet our 45 meter square, uh, like 45 meter floor area, uh, that, that would be what, five, five meters in depth is all you would have then. So you would be much wider than you would be deep. Yeah. So you, you know what I mean? So you, you're not gonna be coming straight in yeah. if you have an eight meter maximum uh, width because it's just going to be too short for your boat. So the only purpose that that bit serves is just to allow for side-loaded boat houses. Does that include the dock? No, it doesn't. No. Because you end up with a 20-foot dock real quick, real wide. Yeah. 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 Um, final points of views on this before we conclude. Over. So the amount of square footage would limit then, if they require for the depth, they would limit the width. Is what you're saying? Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Um, another thing we took a look at um, was we, we have a number of situations in the municipality uh, where we have forced roads. So uh, so prior, they're mostly private roadways, but uh, it's where the road travels across uh, private land essentially. Uh, the, you see this a lot on the laneways along uh, the shores of the two lakes. Uh, the issue with forced roads is in most cases, they don't have uh, a road allowance. So there, there's often no municipally owned road allowance and most of our setbacks measure from the law line and the law line will generally be established by the property line along the road allowance. So speaking of Antoine, uh, we added a, an additional clarification for setbacks from uh, forced roads. And we put that to be 10 meters from the center line of the existing road. And the rationale for that was that uh, a standard width road allowance is 20 meters wide, and it's generally 10 meters on either side of the, of the road, or the, or the center line of the road. So our thought was uh, in situations where someone has a piece of property uh, that a forced road crosses, as long as we require a setback from the forced road that would equal the width of a road allowance, then we can ensure that if that road is ever assumed by the municipality in the future, no structures will actually be on the area that we'll need to take as a road allowance. Uh, 
Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a technical addition, uh, but, uh, but the whole point of this provision is just to make sure that if we ever uh, assume ro private roads in the future and turn them into public roads, uh, hopefully there won't be any privately owned structures on our road allowances. So it, it's intended to safeguard against that. Um, our next one. Uh, so we currently have a provision existing. Uh, it's, it's, it's labeled as public use is permitted in our current zoning bylaw. And uh, essentially what it does is exempt the municipality from all regulations in our zoning bylaw. Uh, the idea behind that provision is that uh, it, just, it just makes it, uh, I, I guess, easier for the municipality to conduct business or, or build certain things. Uh, and it allows us to, to basically not be bound by the rules in our zoning bylaw. Uh, we, had, we received a couple of public comments about that, uh, suggesting that, uh, that maybe it wasn't appropriate that municipality be uh, exempt from, from the rules that we lay out for everyone else. Uh, that seemed like a reasonable comment. So based on those comments, uh, the Planning Advisory Committee recommended that we remove that section. Uh, I think that's totally reasonable as well, uh, given that the municipality uh, not since I've been here, and, and I can't think of any time before that, uh, has the municipality ever exercised that right to be exempt from a zoning provision. So we, we, we do follow our zoning bylaw anyways, and, uh, and we would strive to do that in any circumstance regardless. So I think that it's uh, fair and reasonable that that section be removed. Uh, so essentially what that means is just that uh, if we're doing a municipal project, uh, we will also be down to the rules that we're passing for, for private land uh, which is fair. Um, Before we move off, I have some questions on this point. Uh, other zoning bylaws, do they normally have such a clause, or how? I just. It's um, would be the practice in general. It's sometimes common in small municipalities, which is one of the reasons why it was uh, existing in ours previously. Um, part of the idea with small municipalities is that you have. A very small number of people that are working on basically every project so you can have consistency across like your implementation of, of all of your all of your projects and all of your zoning regulations like there's usually only one planner or a small planning department that's doing everything basically uh, so you sometimes see in smaller places uh, you would never see something like this in a larger place uh, because there's too many departments operating in silos with each other and uh, and it's always better to have those projects come for review through like the normal planning channels. Uh, so yeah, you, you would never see this in a bigger municipality. Uh, you sometimes see it in smaller ones. Uh, we added an additional setback for commercial entrances from railway crossings. Uh, this was uh, also part of Antoine's comments. Uh, this is just uh, this is just following best practice technical standards for uh, uh, for entrances in proximity of uh, rail lines, so that was a that was a quick addition. Uh, the next thing we addressed um, in our official plan, we have a number of policies about second units, and uh, one of the main things is that second units won't be permitted in the waterfront designation. Uh, so that's uh, defined as all the shorelines along uh, Trout Lake, Lake Osmondson, uh, but also Mink Lake on the on the boundary of Chisholm. Uh, so we previously did not have Mink Lake mentioned in the exemption for second units, uh, but it is in our official plan. Uh, we, we only have you know, a small section of the lake, but, uh, but we did need to add that just for consistency with our official plan. Uh, so we added that into the second unit section. Um, we clarified our, uh, our position on coach houses. Uh, so we, we, we previously had it worded in, in a way that uh, that may have implied that uh, second units weren't going to be allowed in accessory structures if they were combined in conjunction with, with a garage. Uh, and that was, that was really never the intention. The intention was if you're going to, if you have a second unit uh, in an accessory structure and that accessory structure complies with all of the height floor area regulations, uh, then uh, there, there was no intention to not allow it because of the garage. Uh, so we, we clarified some of those provisions. Uh, we also had some questions about recreational vehicles and short-term rentals, uh, and we clarified those provisions, stating that uh, a recreational vehicle uh, cannot be used for short-term rental. Um, speaking about short-term rentals, uh, we, we've obviously had a lot of discussion about this topic. Uh, 
we, we initially started from a position where uh, we weren't going to allow them at all, and we were basically going to require uh, amendments to this bylaw to allow them. Uh, I think it's become fairly clear that, um, that it would be preferable to license them and regulate them through a separate bylaw. Uh, I, I think that was the, the general feeling from our last council session, and, uh, and it's also the recommendation from the Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, so the main idea behind this is that it's, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to roll back zoning, zoning permissions once they're granted. So if you had uh, someone come in and they apply for a zoning bylaw amendment, get permission to set up their short-term rental, and then they sell the property, the next person may not be you know, as good of an operator or as courteous to neighbors, et cetera. Uh, so it's very hard to pull back on those permissions afterwards and they do stay with the property forever. Whereas if we uh, if we established uh, like a regulatory bylaw that laid out uh, things like all the requirements to operate short term rental, how your licensing worked, uh, any fines that may be able to be administered if there are violations, uh, then we would have better control because we could easily revoke permits for people who aren't operating properly. Uh, so in in light of all of that. Uh, the recommendation from the planning committee was that we, we do allow short-term rentals uh, more broadly. Uh, however, in the bylaw, we added a text that they're subject to uh, the short-term rental bylaw, uh, which does not yet exist, but the recommendation from the planning committee to council was that, uh, that you direct staff to start the process to implement a short-term rental bylaw. Uh, and uh, I agree with that recommendation. I, I think that that's what we should do, and I think that would be the most effective way to manage short-term rentals going forward. Uh, so if there's, if there's any questions about this one, we could, uh, we could talk about it because it's a big one. Yeah, okay. just a comment more on else. Um, we had talked about adopting what we were doing in Huntsville, right? There's one scenario. What's happening with Bonco and North Bay? Are they on board with, with this? Because I find it's going to be a little hard for us to uh, license something on one part of the lake and the other part of the lake aren't doing it. I'm talking about Troll Lake and mm -hmm. Um I I would say that well so North Bay is looking into this um, and they're they're working on their own policies. Uh, that being said, uh, I don't think that there's an issue with us doing it on part of the lake if, if North Bay doesn't do it on their part of the lake. Uh, we have the jurisdiction over what we want to happen on the shoreline that is within our municipality. So, if we uh, if we want to regulate how they operate, uh, I, I think that's well within our right to do it, uh, despite what North Bay is doing. I realize what you're saying, but I'm just saying for our ratepayers that are doing it, and they don't have to follow the same guidelines, the same doing it as the next door neighbor because he happens to be in Bonfield or North Bay. Mm -hmm. How does that going to make us look like? You mean if we're more restrictive than yeah. that? Well, I, I think that uh, we, we kind of have a duty to our residents as a whole to make sure that they have reasonable protection and enjoyment of their property. So if, if we're regulating uh, more heavily, uh, as long as we're finding an appropriate balance, I, I think we can defend the fact that we're ensuring that a reasonable standard is kept for the properties that are providing these rentals. I'm sure the question will come up. That's why I'm asking it now. I think it's probably the best time to ask it. Yeah. Because it's been at least we've all in the same agreement. That's what I'm getting at. So I think that um, the, the way I would see, uh, like stepping back from the zoning bylaw for a second, uh, if we do go the route of, uh, of allowing them and then regulating them through a short term rental bylaw, uh, the way I would see the implementation process for that working is that we would uh, basically. Um, announce that we're working on this bylaw and we would host a, a public consultation period and session similar to the way we've dealt with it for this bylaw, uh, where we would get all the public comment from people on both sides of this issue because there is a lot of interest both uh, like pro and, and against uh, short-term rentals. So I think that we would, uh, we would host a public consultation session, draft a policy, uh, put the draft policy out there, uh, do a second round of public consultation and then bring a policy to council. Uh, so I, I think that we would have um, a lot of opportunity if we did structure it that way to make sure that we got public feedback on both sides. And if, I would, if we would do that, I would recommend that we uh, uh, give the opportunity for the municipalities to join us and let them know what we're doing. We can definitely circulate them on it. Yeah. At least we'll be on the same page and they've had the opportunity to do it. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, it's probably the most contentious issue that we faced yeah. in this zoning. 
you know, the procedure that we've gone through. In furtherance to that, uh, the recommendation coming from the committee will be to counsel to set a committee of, of uh, people of their own choosing, obviously, whether we want the public or just counselors and staff, whatever. Uh, but just in addition to that, I had a phenomenal meeting on Friday. Um, I was I was virtual, but the, some of the people were in that too. Now, there's been a proliferation of not only uh, B&Bs and other rental types across Northern Ontario, there's a, a big proliferation of uh, trailers and they become permanent in nature. Uh, the councillor from uh, Timbers, by the way, because they're having a the time. There's two and three trailers on some lots and uh, various uses. MPAC, mm -hmm. so we had a, represent, a presentation by MPAC. MPAC are willing to come up and assess trailers if they're of a permanent nature. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not what we heard maybe eight, 10 years ago when we went around the lake. But that's what's going on right now because we've got trailers on the lake. As in, I'm not guessing speak for Trout Lake, I know. We've got a ton of them. And uh, they've got a lot of additions. They're basically cottages that happen to have wheels that probably never turn because of the attachments of them. So, because uh, the committee, one of the recommendations was to enforce the bylaws that are already on our books. We'd have to have a bylaw office. And to make it revenue neutral, we'd have to have a licensing fee and so forth. It'd be a yearly basis. So that'd be one of the recommendations coming through. But we could add to that, permanent, permanent style trailers can be assessed. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that we've seen a, a major growth in that as we, anyone on the lake knows. So that's uh, an, that's an addition for the duties of a bio office. That's not just on the lake. Not just on the lake, exactly. And uh, no, there's actually one, there's one or two sites that uh, you've got a book way ahead. No, I won't go into the neighborhood, but. Oh, it's a good. fact. No, I mean, but the eleven trailers parked on the property have been there for ten years. Exactly. So, what's going on? People are taking advantage of a loophole mm -hmm. and lack of enforcement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I say taking advantage. They're recognizing a loophole and saying, you know, here's what I can do, and they're not paying taxes. Right. So not paying, in my opinion, not paying the fair share. They're enjoying all the services. Mm -hmm. B and B. That was the argument that came up as well. That people are short term. Some and get some cases for a weekend or a day. Well, the rules don't apply because you know, so there's a lot, there's a lot coming to council at the council meeting. This is one of the it, 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 and you're right, it's very contentious issue. Mm -hmm. Some are for, some are yeah. dead against. So well, it'll be the council's good, decision what we do. We've struck a good position going forward. I just said the, the direction we're heading in is over there. You too. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention also. We also, I think when we skipped was uh, permitted uses of storage containers. Uh, do we skip? I'm not sure, did you mention freight containers not being utilized? Uh, not yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can <laughs> definitely talk about that though. <laughs> and not to be forgotten. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we, can, we can talk about that right now, so. <laughs> no, I, just, I didn't know it was on the schedule, thank you. Yeah, no. So, we, so we talked about uh, about freight containers uh, not being permitted uh, in residential zones, and uh, and we did maintain that uh, that prohibition. Uh, however, we did add an exemption saying that they could be used for storage of construction materials uh, because we do recognize that people do use them on a temporary basis. Uh, we 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 define that as up to a year, uh, but we allow them to be used uh, on a site for uh, for construction of either a new home or an addition or, or anything like that. And that, uh, that I think makes sense also. Thank you. Um, okay, so any more questions about short term rentals before we go ahead? I would, uh, I'm, I'm with Councillor Champagne though. I would like to involve the uh, surrounding municipality. Let, at least let them know, because I know North Bay's looking at it. Yes, there is. So why reinvent the wheel? And, we're, mm -hmm. and once again, that came up uh, from the Councillor from North Bay, mm -hmm. our former mayor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to get it passed on the, as Greg found out, the corporation of the town of Huntsville, because they've had it in place for some time mm -hmm. and it seems to work. And there's, uh, and there's a lot of teeth in what they've got. So, mm -hmm. you know, but I would, I went with Councilor Champagne. Let's involve the other municipalities, at least give them a heads up of what we're doing. And if uh, they want to be part of the task force, there's no reason, in my opinion, that becomes a decision. 
Thank you. Yeah, we uh, we will absolutely do that, and uh, and I think we'll uh, if uh, if council uh, goes forward with the, this approach, uh, then I think we should add to the resolution that uh, that I start the process for engagement on a short term rental bylaw, uh, basically first thing. Well, that'll be coming up to the council meeting on Tuesday. Okay? Yeah, we'll we'll do it when yep. we do the bylaw. That sounds great. But uh, but I, I think we should get going that uh, first thing mm -hmm. after Christmas. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next one, uh, this is also, this is from the resolution uh, from planning committee. Uh, the second comment uh, following short term rentals was that uh, we adopt a registration process to track uh, second units and coach houses. Uh, the reason why this recommendation is in here is because uh, in talking with, uh, with the fire chief, um, there is, there's some concern sometimes if, uh, if the emergency services are responding to a house fire, let's say, and uh, and they don't know how many units are in a building or how many people could be living there. Uh, so this recommendation is uh, is following on uh, on the fire chief's advice that uh, that we should track this data so that we can make it available to emergency services for the purpose of responding to calls. Uh, so I, I think that's a very good idea, and uh, and I think that that resolution or that recommendation should be carried forward in our resolution next week as well. Mm -hmm. So the next one that, that we uh, changed was uh, we <clears throat> we have a few things where we allow um, uh, exemptions to setbacks. Uh, so things like uh, your eaves and gutters, uh, uh, fire escapes, uh, uh, different structures like that are allowed to encroach into the required setback in certain in certain yards. Um, one of the provisions uh, allowed for the exemption for ornamental structures. Uh, this was something that was carried over from uh, from the existing bylaw. Um, we removed this. Uh, we, we saw a couple, uh, I guess, pretty extreme examples of, of ornamental structures in uh, in the scope areas that people put on to docks and boat houses. Uh, I'm, I'm laughing a bit because the pictures we, we saw were, um, I, I guess, art pieces of art we could say, but they were they were fairly extreme. So. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, we removed uh, the exemption for ornamental type structures. And uh, and if there is a situation where something like this may be necessary for whatever reason, uh, then I think it's best that we just deal with it through minor variants. Uh, so that, that was removed. Um, we talked about the setbacks um, required for buildings from water bodies, wetlands, streams, and rivers. Uh, so our bylaw, uh, propose a 30 meter setback from from all water bodies uh, with the with the exception of the lakes because they have their own sets of regulations uh, but one of our discussions was about uh, whether 30 meters may be too much uh, when it comes to accessory structures like sheds you know garages etc uh, if you have a small stream for flowing through your property uh, a 30 meter setback for a shed <coughs> may uh, May like severely limit or or make it almost impossible for you to even even put anything within huge portions of smaller lots. Uh, so so the idea was that maybe thirty meters should be kept for a main building because it has a larger impact, and then maybe we reduce that for for accessory structures because the chance of an impact to an environmental feature is much lower. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to the conservation authority about this. Uh, their regulatory authority um, will always extend thirty meters back either way. So we, we do have a bit of comfort if we drop this, knowing that uh, if there's a specific example where where you do need a larger setback, uh, the conservation authority will have that review process through their DIA permitting. Uh, so we, we basically propose to remove uh, uh, remove the 30 meters and implement a 15 meter setback. Uh, we just thought that that was like a bit of a good uh, compromise, I guess, for structures that aren't generally going to impact uh, feature negatively and just giving people more flexibility when it comes to building small storage sheds. I, I, I believe it's in our official plan that uh, we we were the only ones that are doing it that we put it through. I think John Tiro was on at the time, where a septic system can go the furthest point on the property because some properties don't have thirty meters <coughs> to work with. And I believe it's in ours that says that it, it's put at the furthest point. On the residential, not on a garage or a, an additional, right? For the septic system. Yeah. So the septic system, our official plan says, will be sixty meters away from the lake. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then it can go to a minimum of 30 with a minor variance. Uh, and then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't speak to uh, other large features, or it doesn't speak to anything about the furthest point. Uh, that is something that the Conservation Authority uh, implements through their septic permitting, though. Uh, we'll, we'll always look for it to go as far away from possible as potential or of, uh, from like a sensitive feature. I, just not to be negative, but we should look into and call the Conservation Authority because there is something in our official plan somewhere that says that because it was put through by John Tier because some of them, the lots weren't quite uh, 30 meters. I think we put it in there and say the furthest point possible in the property. From from a lake? From a lake or a stream. I'll, I'll double check, but uh, but I'm fairly certain that, uh, that the 60 meter setback is required. And then it says that you can reduce that via minor variance to 30. And then uh, then anything below 30 would just not be permitted. Because we ran into that because they're saying there was an old cottage on it. So we want to put a house on it. It didn't, it couldn't do it. Okay. So we just said automatically in these fairs, we're the only ones that put that in place that it goes to the furthest point on the property. <clears throat> Because you can't stop people from building or living there. Otherwise, you have to go with a holding tank and it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, or, or composting toilets or other servicing mechanisms, which is possible. Um, I will double check that before next week. Uh, and I'll let you know. Okay, uh, we're almost done with this now, but uh, the next one was we made, um, we made a few amendments to our parking space dimensions. Uh, Antoine uh, basically advised that. Uh, that standard practice would dictate certain dimensions and widths. Uh, so we, we dropped the, our, our, our plan one was uh, about three by six meters. And he said that about 2.6 by 5.5 is, is more standard. Uh, so we, we changed our parking dimensions in line with what, uh, what would be a more accepted provincial standard. I have a question, Greg. Sure. Did we ever review, I can't remember, the commercial the commercial vehicle stuff wait remember we were talking about buses yes we did and talk so i was about flipping that. through this and i was like i don't remember talking do you remember that terry i do and it was uh, a gray gonna... area and no one really had an answer because some people have buses and they're above fifteen thousand pounds yeah anyway the re only reason i'm bringing it up now is because a i forgot in the um i flipped to this page mm -hmm. and i remember we were going to check with um, Mr. Champagne, because everybody basically everybody who drives a bus yeah. for the most part parks yeah. sit in their driveway so um, or beside their house or structure. Just making mm -hmm. note of that. You don't have to give an answer now. I just yeah. know that that was something. Like for everybody to take a bus home, and just bus back to the bus lines every night would be expensive for the bus lines. Mm -hmm. It'd be expensive for the drivers because now you've got to mm -hmm. use your own vehicle to get to and from. States here that it can't happen. Yeah. So so on for the page forty six. For the benefit of council and anyone watching, uh, what uh, what we're referring to is is a provision in the bylaw that uh, uh, that prevents people from storing commercial vehicles on their property if they exceed fifteen thousand pounds, and uh, the the intent of that is to allow people to bring home uh, like like smaller work related vehicles, uh, like small like cube van or something like that, uh, but not allow people to be parked in tractor trailers or larger vehicles on their property uh, in residential areas. Uh, and uh, that would hurt guys with uh, yes. a dump truck or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the rural areas are exempted, though. Sorry? The, the, the idea would be to uh, uh, restrict it in the residential areas, and the rural areas would be exempted. So what would the uh, Ridge Mount be on our Ridge Mount on the drive? Ridge Mount's a neighborhood, right? Yeah, so it, would it, would be, it would be restricted there. And he's been there in business for? Mm -hmm. Yep. 25 years. Yeah. So that would that would definitely affect him. And they do have a number of No, it doesn't. It's, it's residential, it's got a farm. So he's got a dump truck and a trailer for it was mm -hmm. over twenty thousand. But did farm extend that or uh it would depend on the zoning. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so if it's zoned, uh, so most of Meadow Drive is zoned uh Hamlet residential because it's within the village mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Uh so yeah, I mean, I mean, I get where you're coming from. Uh, the idea behind this provision was that in the more dense residential areas, uh, it's maybe not the most sightly thing that people parking dump trucks at their house. And and the idea was to to restrict that and limit it to the larger lots in the rural area. So a bunch of people get the idea of snap on tools that lives on Quick Road. His vehicle weighs definitely over 25,000. Right. But that's not the that. That's the rural area. That's rural. Yeah. 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 
I mean, it's uh, it's entirely up to council. If, if that's something we feel okay with, we, we can strike that entire provision from the bylaw. Uh, this type of provision is, is fairly standard in zoning bylaws, and it's intended to keep a consistent residential character in residential areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we if we feel that that's something that happens in our community and it's you know part of the nature of living in East Ferris, then mm -hmm. we, we can make that amendment. It hasn't been a problem to, to my knowledge mm -hmm. in the past. I mean, and no one's uh, mm -hmm. no one's abused it. We don't get back track, we don't get trailers and you know, all like it has not been abused. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. So I, I can't see a reason for it. It's a non-issue. It's a non-issue, non exactly. Yeah, another another way I've seen provisions like this written uh, and something we can consider is that uh, you, you could say something like commercial vehicles parked at home uh, may only be parked in a driveway or on a parking area or something like that, and then that ensures that people aren't parking multiple commercial vehicles across the lawn or, or you know having large storage lots. So that there are kind of hybrid provisions that could be written. So um, why is this on the radar? Uh, it's not really on the radar because of any specific reason. It's just a, a very standard type of provision you see in most zoning bylaws. And it probably was already there. Uh, it, it is already there. Yeah. It, it's not quite written the same way. It wasn't written that way, but uh, we do have a limitation mm -hmm. uh, in place. Uh, it didn't have a restriction on later size, though. Uh, uh, and it only, it, it's both more vacant lots. So we kind of carried over and modified it a little bit. Could we maintain what we have? What, uh, what, did, what do we have? What, how does it... So what we have right now is just the limitation on storing commercial vehicles on vacant lots. Mm -hmm. And the idea is just not to have people buying property and, and set up storage at the RIs without appropriate zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we have that provision in another place in the bylaw. Okay. So we, we certainly could just remove this altogether if we don't feel that it's an issue. And it's then, a good idea. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think it's my yeah. And that doesn't mean we can't add it in the future if we find exactly. it to if be it becomes a problem. Yeah. Right. Because right. I'm also thank you for raising it because there's a lot of people that have livelihoods that have trucks of different forms. And so that is a good point that you're making. Bus drivers do bring their well, buses home due to yeah. me. And so it, it's a good observation. Well, for, you know, let's say, for instance, someone's driving a tow truck. Mm -hmm. well, they drive it home at night and they leave. Well, they're mm -hmm. saying you can't have it and all you need is come. You know, a neighbor yep. that doesn't like you, then you're you're asking for trouble. And that, and that in some cases, it becomes an emergency vehicle because somebody has to get removed as fast as possible off the road. And if we do run into an issue in the future, we can have it added. It's not, sure. no. not something that yes, exactly. makes sense. Okay, I agree. Okay, that's good. We will do that. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on. We uh, we made a change. Uh, so we, we added definitions and provisions around uh, solar and wind farms. Uh, this um, this didn't or doesn't currently exist in our bylaw, uh, but uh, but we are starting to see more of these type of alternative energy uh, projects. Uh, so up until recently, uh, regulations basically didn't allow us to. Uh, to really control those, uh, however, we now can. Uh, so uh, we received uh, we received a comment about uh, about maybe maybe they're you know maybe they should be a little more tightly regulated because they could be uh, potentially a contentious project. Uh, so wind farms uh, you know often can can draw a lot of public interest because of their appearance, size, perceived uh, you know potential health impacts, um, but. Uh, what we decided to do was uh, basically just require that those be established by a specific amendment to the bylaw. And the idea there is just that we we ensure that there's a public consultation project or process on every one of those projects. Uh, that being said, we're probably not going to get any wind farms because uh, when you look at wind maps in Ontario, uh, East Ferris is in a very suitable area for that type of uh, that type of project. Uh, solar, hopefully we see more of that. Uh, but, uh, but the idea is that when those projects do come in, we'll do site-specific amendments to ensure public consultation on, on all of them. Um, well, some of them, we, we got no jurisdiction on them. Uh, we didn't previously, but there were amendments to legislation that do allow us to, to do... Uh, when did this happen? Uh, two years ago. Yeah. They repealed the Green Act. For well, the yeah. one over here, has it been two years? Yes, that, yeah. one, uh, yeah, that one, well, municipality we granted the... Uh, because I had asked Paul about it and because I thought I was doing something about it, but he oh turned around and said, No, we've got no jurisdiction. We need to respond. 
So yeah. since then, it has changed. It, yeah, it was so part of it's part of the repeal of uh, uh, yeah, a lot of those provisions of the Green Energy Act. But then also when the incentives for electric vehicles and stuff when that was all repealed by the Ford government that, that came up then. So, um, and then, uh, and then the final thing uh, in consultation with David Germain. Uh, we added a provision just to uh, clarify how legal non-conforming uh, uh, provisions of the Planning Act apply. Uh, so this refers to uh, people who have lots that are uh, currently smaller than standards. So you need to have a provision in your zoning bylaw that, that allows the legal non-conforming status to apply. Uh, we needed to add this because uh, without adding this, it uh, it basically means that anybody who has lots that are smaller than our current standards would, would not be able to get building permits under a legal non-conforming status, uh, which would be a, a very large problem for a lot of residents in the community. So this is just um, this is just ensuring legislative compliance. Um, and then that is that is everything from the changes uh, since the last council session to now. Uh, there are two other items that I that I wanted to discuss with council. Um, the first one uh, came from uh, came from some notes from our last session uh, that weren't discussed at the Planning Advisory Committee uh, meeting on December first. Uh, so we, we'd spoken about um, about maybe we should increase the lot coverage for smaller lots. Uh, the reason being is that sometimes it can be difficult for an existing lot uh, that, that's smaller than our standard. Uh, to meet uh, their their ten percent lot coverage because ten percent is is our are basically standard across almost all zones. Uh, so we discussed uh, maybe permitting a fifteen percent maximum lot coverage uh, for lots that are under two acres, and then that just means that you have a little bit more flexibility if you want to build a garage or, or build an addition to your home uh, if you have a lot that's that's smaller. So for example, if you have a lot that's half an acre in size all of your structures are, are limited to approximately 2,000 square feet. So that can get kind of difficult if you're trying to put a garage with the house. Uh, so a 15% lot coverage would, would bump that up a little bit. You have you know, a few hundred square feet more to work with. That would be single dwellings. Uh, yeah, see, it would be all lots, but it would primarily relate to residential. Okay, because I'll make sure on that, because uh, I'm even looking at maybe hoping looking at changes anything bigger than duplex on a small property has to go by case by case and has to be brought back because I don't we all know what we're talking about here. So I just want to make sure if the law is not really technically big enough for a fourplex that anything over a duplex should be case by case on a small lot. I agree. So so this would this would apply to all zones that have a 10% lot coverage. Uh, and commercial zones, uh, for the most part, have higher lot coverage permissions, so it wouldn't apply to those. Uh, but this, the the idea would be to add this so that all zones that require ten percent for residential would be permitted fifteen percent if they're smaller than uh, than two acres. Uh, we weren't going to differentiate that based on type of use, but uh, but we can if there's concern. Um, would you be able to repeat your question about the about the duplex? I, well, I'm just, all I'm saying is, if you have anything bigger than a duplex on a on a property that's one and a half acre property, mm -hmm. I think anything bigger than a duplex should be case by case brought to planning board and see if it's a if it's feasible. It, even if problem is if it's in our in our official plan, says yeah, you can do it. Well, if it doesn't follow the criteria around the surrounding areas, well, it shouldn't be done. But because it says so, we're kind of bound by it and we're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Do you follow what I'm trying to say? I think so. Uh, so, our looking at our residential provisions right now, uh, we we do limit uh, we do limit uh, townhouse dwellings or multiple residential dwellings to uh, to lots that are only 0.8 hectares, so two acres or larger. So, they would already need to be going to the committee of adjustment for a minor variance for a lot. Uh, Lot area reduction if they're going to be building on a smaller lot. So I, I think we're okay there because that uh, that limitation on lot area uh, would by you know by virtue of that it would automatically require them to be at the committee of adjustment for for any changes on lots smaller than two acres. So I, I think we're covered based on what you're saying. We just changed that, correct? No, that's how he had it. Okay, so yeah, you, yeah, you, you changed this this time. Is that correct? 
No, it's no, no, okay. right. so, so, but what about what about in the in the villages or multiple multiple dwellings? What's the minimum size in the in the villages? So the, the villa, the villa. It's, it's 0.8 hectares for townhouses. Mm -hmm. So two acres. Two acres are or larger. Uh, what we've discussed at planning committee was that uh, uh, lots that were smaller, uh, we, we could deal with the two minor variants. So, so to your question, Council Champagne, uh, anything that permits uh, multiple residential beyond duplex uh, would be covered under one of those two definitions that requires 0 0.8 hectares or larger. Um, so if anyone wanted to build those type of dwellings on a lot smaller than two acres, they would already be a big of adjustment asking for an exemption to the lot area provision. So, uh, so we would automatically be taking a look at them. Okay, uh, I, I agree and disagree. I think it should be looked at, physically looked at, not just on paper. What I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. okay. A lot of people don't go and look at the properties and all the just sit in front of them and listen to a, I don't know if I can talk about this. A developer. You know, Listen to a developer who paints the best picture right. imaginable. Obviously, that's their job. Yeah. And try to sell it, but if it doesn't yeah. look good, we just can't talk about the specifics. We don't it, talk. It, it doesn't, yeah. If it doesn't fall in our hamlet and doesn't look right in the hamlet, it shouldn't be in the hamlet. I guess what exactly. I'm saying. I do not agree with that. So, when things go before the committee of adjustment, um, there, there is an expectation that for uh, certain files or when required, that the committee members will go visit the properties. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we uh, we, we give a stipend uh, per meeting to uh, to each committee member. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that those are covered in our in our uh, boards and committees policies. Um, if if there is a feeling that those need to strengthen and, and you know specify exactly when site visits are required, then, then maybe we should look at an amendment to the boards and committees policy. Uh, I don't think that the zoning bylaw is the place to talk about requirements for site visit, visits for, for planning committee or committee of adjustment, uh, but um, but that may be a good conversation for for another another time. Uh, yes, the capital. Uh, this actually initially came up because, uh, especially on the lake, you know, Years ago, as we both know, we the uh, the lots are extremely small, and especially I know in my area, I mean, uh, and your side of the lake as well. So a lot of times, people were restricted; they couldn't they couldn't build a, a decent sized garage to hold a pontoon boat, maybe a lawn tractor, maybe a slide or two, or, or side by side or whatever. So uh, we would rather see a nice garage covering a little bit more area, and all the toys inside the garage. And have it helter skelter looking like everything's on set when it's not a yard sale at all, just that there's no structure to put the toys in. So that's where it came from. Yeah, because there are quite a few lots actually on the lake that are um, that are older historical lots that are about 0.3, 0.4 of an acre in size. And uh, I, I just did a bit of quick math here while we were talking, and uh, 0.3 of an acre is about 13,000 square feet. So if we have a 10% lot coverage per provision, that's only 1,300 square feet for all buildings and structures on lot. And uh, you can really quickly run out of 1,300 square feet by the time you have a, a cottage, which may already be near the maximum. And then to come to Kelly's point, uh, you, you don't have any flexibility when it comes to building a small garage or another storage shed. Uh, so, so that was the idea behind the 15%, just to give a little bit more flexibility to these, these small existing lots. I had the sense that at our last meeting that council, all council members were in agreement with that and support of that. Unless you saw a problem as you reflected on this further, we're good to, to proceed with that? Yeah, I, I don't see a problem. I think that that's a reasonable compromise. And, and I don't think that 15% lot coverage, we, we still have to consider, like more broadly speaking, uh, if you have 15% of your lot covered with structures, um, that, that's a very small amount of the entire lot. Like, I, I don't see a 15% uh, covered lot appearing to be overdeveloped really, really any more than a 10% one would. Like, that additional 5% is going to be difficult or difficult to gauge, uh, like, when you're looking at it. So, I think we get a little bit more flexibility. And, and I don't think we're really in risk of having the lots appear to be overdeveloped, which would be the intent of this provision. And I, I, I personally, in line with what the Council of Champlain, I mean, we're all concerned about the types of establishments that go forward in our in our hamlets and the impact that it has on the appearance of our villages. Um, 
And so it's difficult to draft uh, 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 bylaws for all situations, but certainly from my point of view, one concern is with, for example, the redevelopment of the old school in Astorville. At some point, that will hopefully come forward in the future. And I think to, uh, in line with our official plan, we will be looking at some form of uh, uh, higher density housing, because I think that that's what that law calls for to some extent. Um, it's, it's going to be very difficult for anyone that wants to develop that property and, and to put up just two houses. They, they won't be able to get a return on their investment. It's just, it's not, it's under five acres. So that means two houses. And um, so I think for sure, at some point, we're going to be looking at some form of townhouses or condos or apartment buildings. And so I'm, I was concerned and I expressed that in my written comments that I shared with you, that if we have a zoning bylaw that is too restrictive, it could hurt us then as well. I mean, just to have been involved with the seniors' villas, the projects, even the last one, there was a there was a lot of always of public concert, uh, concerns. They come forward, and, and all times I was very surprised that with the last project by seniors' villa, people were concerned about lighting pollution. People were concerned. It, it just it, it, it caught me by surprise, actually. And I did a lot of door to door with other members of the community, um, and so it really made me aware. And I, I don't doubt that the day we do look to develop this, the, the old school property, that there will be public comments to a substantial degree. And we wouldn't want that to prevent that, the ability to go forward and to do something about that property that's been abandoned and it looks almost... Um, it's an eyesore. It's an eyesore in our community. Mm -hmm. So that I was coming at it from that perspective and wanting to have as well a zoning bylaw that allows and, and I mean, it's interesting to, I was asking how many like, two acre properties are there actually in the village, villages and in Astorville, I know when we were doing the Seniors Villa, when the issue of, you know, the fact that the property that was owned by Seniors Villa was very small, and we were looking at, I mean, not very small properties to put up the units, but we looked at other options and there weren't, I mean, they were either, uh, and, and I know Seniors Villa wanted to be in the village core, they felt that that was essential for the, the type of people that live in those units mm -hmm. to be in the village core. I think in Corbele it would be a little different. There are, uh, but still, I, I think, you know, I mean, but it depends on whether or not there's a few available properties are available for, for sale. So it brings us into that particular issue. As we look mm -hmm. at, I like a nice project, for example, in Kwasa, they just put up an apartment building. It's in the core. And I understand there's a lot of demand for that. And, Anyway, the long and the short of it is that um, we are going forward with this zoning bylaw, but certainly in the future, we would have to be willing as a council to work through these issues and find solutions to them. And a final comment, our reality is different. We do want to remain on septic and well water, and we don't want to have services. So, I mean, it will never be high and density development or because we can't do that. We're limited by, by that, but... I, at the same time, I don't think at the old school property to be thinking about maybe there being eight units. I mean, that's what we have in the villas, or uh, more than that, that that would necessarily be wrong for that property. You know, would that be zone residential or is it reserved for commercial? That, that, they probably rest. Uh, yeah, it, it would most likely be zone residential. So um, almost certainly um, the old school property would uh, would require an amendment for special zoning. Uh, which would lay out exactly what type of use is. Um, because the way our, our bylaw is written, uh, if we assume for sake of argument that the townhouses were proposed, uh, we're only allowed four units uh, per lot for a townhouse block based on the way that this is written. So if there was a desire to do more dense housing uh, or more units, uh, it would automatically require a zoning bylaw amendment for a special zone to you know, define exactly what types of housing. Um, I, I would tend to agree with Mayor Oshkirk that that site may be a good candidate for some type of mixed housing type development, uh, but it would obviously depend entirely on uh, availability of water, uh, the layout of, of where the units would be, uh, what type of proposal they have as far as setbacks go, um, and, uh, and all of those things would need to be submitted by, by whatever person uh, ultimately purchased the lot and decided to develop it. Uh, so I, I think it's I think it's a little bit uh, maybe too early to speculate on uh, on what could go there, um, but uh, but also uh, I don't think that um, the changes to the zoning bylaw uh, really have too much of a direct impact on that property since it's going to require a special zoning anyways to develop it, and uh, the official plan policies that will apply to it are in place already and also won't change through this process. 
So I, I don't see it as maybe directly related to uh, to the bylaw that, that we're passing now, uh, but, uh, but but I do see it as being a site that will require its own uh, own zoning and own public consultation process when when required. Case by case. Yes, it will be case by case for this site. And for any other site that required uh, more units, uh, it would also be case by case for that as well. All right, so 15% uh, lock coverage. So uh, I, I get the feeling we're, we're all generally in agreement with, uh, with increasing that for smaller lots. Um, okay, and the, um, uh, the other comment I have, uh, this, uh, this was um, a comment that I received uh, since our last planning committee meeting on December 1st. Uh, so we didn't get a chance to talk about it at uh, planning committee, uh, but we had a resident specifically ask about uh, uh, our home uh, home occupation provisions. So uh, these are the provisions that allow people to do things like uh, like run a bookkeeping office out of their home or, or some other similar service based uh, uh, thing like that as a home based business. Um, in our in our home occupation provisions, we we say that uh, uh, you can do you know X Y and Z. However, there's some limitations, and you're not allowed to have a retail store. You're not allowed to have a restaurant. Uh, and you're also not allowed to have a medical office. So medical office is defined in our bylaw as uh, basically a doctor, dentist, or other practitioner licensed under uh, like the health regulations in Ontario. Uh, so one of the comments that I received was from someone asking about uh, registered mas uh, massage therapy uh, and whether that would be permitted. And um, it wasn't my intention to prohibit uh, massage therapists as a home-based business. Uh, the reason being is because uh, we limit the number of people that are allowed to operate the home-based business. So in home occupation, it can only be ran and operated by the owner of the home. So you, as a massage therapist in that situation, you would be seeing one client at a time, the same as you would any other kind of individual service-based thing. Uh, however, massage therapists are licensed under the Ontario um, like Health Professionals Framework. So strictly speaking, the way it's written, uh, they, they wouldn't be permitted because of that licensing framework. So I, I think it is probably reasonable to create an exemption for massage therapists uh, and potentially other similar types of, of single service providers. Um, the intention is to not have, uh, uh, I, I know we have the Dolphin LA set up, but uh, but the intention is to not have large scale clinics with like a lot of additional parking and waiting rooms and uh, and things like that in, in areas uh, like on go forward. Um, so uh, I feel that there an exception for massage therapy is probably reasonable and something we could accommodate, uh, but, uh, but I'd be happy to hear council's thoughts on that comment that we received. Just one question, are you saying that people are being in competition, people are actually pay taxes and actually pay for uh, commercial properties. Mm -hmm. Would that not affect them in one way or another? Would they not be upset about this? Uh, it may, uh, but if you have a commercial property, you have the flexibility to have multiple additional services, more staff, uh, more people on site at a time. You can sell things as part of a retail store with your business. Uh, those are all things you can't do as a home based business. Um, it would it would create of course it's going to create some competition if you're doing the same type of business as someone else uh however our intention with our home-based provision our home-based business provisions is uh uh is to be flexible i mean we, we always talk about uh how home-based businesses are a huge part of mm -hmm. you know people in these Ferris, and we want to encourage uh and uh, and provide i guess like limited restriction for people that are operating home-based businesses so uh, yeah, I, I feel that it's uh, that it's reasonable to have one person operating business with one person coming in and coming out. And um, and part of the reason why you have home-based businesses is it can serve as an incubator for, for a business that's growing. And then once they grow, they have the client base, the clientele, then they move to a commercial site. And that's, that's kind of another reason why you have home-based businesses. Well, it's just, just a question or is someone looking to actually do this? Uh, someone potentially looking to do this. Uh, it was a comment we received from someone looking to move to the community and they were wondering about permissions. And we already have people that operate massage therapy services out of their home that does exist. Well, one thing to keep in mind in these fairs, our, our business tax rate is very competitive with our residential tax rate. So they certainly need to provide that as an incentive, right? That's, that's why, why, that's why it's so 
Yes. It's a, good, it's a good question, and but um, well, we do have good answers for it in that sense. So that's. No, I like playing the devil's advocate. So Wait, to 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 yeah, the, yeah. the neighbor will complain, and yeah. who's going to complain to? Sure. Be Greg and be us, right? Greg keeps changing his phone number. So if I, if I understand correctly, what's involved is what's been added. I'm sorry, I did uh, like on a three point one three home occupation, home industry. Or is it just those are definitions? Those are they're defined. Oh, That's yes. what it is. Okay, yeah. Thank yeah, you. no, the, the, the comment was just about whether a massage therapist could be exempt from uh, uh, from it from the medical office definition because medical mm -hmm. office defines as uh, people regulated under the health professionals act. Yes. Okay. okay. So we're saying yes. I think that that's a fair, fair distinction. I, I never intended for massage therapists to be to be exempt, uh, but it's uh, I'll take whatever direction council provides on this. Yeah. Is, is council comfortable with that? We do have a number of residents. That I think you, some of us would be surprised to see who's offering massage therapy services. Yeah, just... well, we're, we're we're building a building right now, and we're going to allow for that to happen. So you're taking. We have pilots, yes. Well, well, we're building the medical center so it would be centralized, quite frankly. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. Was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're kind of in competition with these people are going to be in competition with our medical center to a certain extent. But it's, it's already taking place. I mean, well, these dollars aren't so big, you can only handle so many massage people, and so many doctors. True. Just thinking out loud, that's what I'm saying. Playing the devil's advocate because you're going to play the You got a building over there that can do it quiet. You got that many vehicles. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. Yeah, so something to think. You know what? This, I think it's worth consideration. We'll talk about it until Tuesday. Okay. We need to bring it back up again on this. Yeah, it, it would be, I think it would be best to get a resolution to it now, if possible. The only reason mm -hmm. being is that I want to bring a final copy of the bylaw to the to council meeting on Tuesday. Uh, we, we can definitely push it back. It's just that if we make amendments on Tuesday, then, uh, then we won't be able to pass the bylaw next week. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I just want to make one comment. We do have in our community, like official garages, but at the same time, we do have a number of people that do um, work on vehicles in their um, in their backyards or in the garages. Massage therapist is often a predominantly female type uh, occupation. And I find that that uh, I, I personally, I, I see a little bit that we might be uh, zeroing in on, you know, the likelihood of some people in our community. And I, I'm not sure if that's I, also what we want to achieve. So I would ask us to consider that. Anyway, I'm, I'm not set personally. I just wanted to make those additional comments. But uh, I, I turn it over to council. For your thoughts and, and uh, I think it's good. I think you're looking for our direction today. Yeah, possible. So we've made we've been made to think about it in more broader uh, terms. Thank you, Councilor Shaw. So massage therapy is happening at the wellness clinic over here. Yes. I think yes. Room. I, I think. We're going to do the same thing in medical. Is there massage therapy there? Well, it's good to chiropractors. So I guess what's going to happen. So we need to also. I think. I think there's room for all. But that's my opinion. But I hear what you're saying. Don't broaden it too much that we might lose some of Yeah, but there's also the benefit in my mind of being a part of that clinic is you have the referrals of each other inside of it, but you mm -hmm. can maybe not get in any other way, like that professional kind of referral system inside of the building. Mm -hmm. You would get. Yeah. There's some benefits of being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think it's okay the way it is. Greg, did you did you mention that they have to be licensed through the health authorities? So this is the authorities? this is the reason why the question came up is because in our home occupation provisions uh, we say that home occupation cannot be uh, a doctor, a dentist. Uh, or another health professional license under the like, Health Act in, uh, uh, in Ontario. Okay. So massage therapists are licensed in uh, in the okay. Ontario kind of Health Practitioner yeah. Framework. Uh, so that would mean that they would not be able to set up as a home occupation right now. And so the the, the question uh, and the, the request we received uh, was whether an exemption could be made for massage therapists because. Um, 
because of them being somewhat different than, than a standard, I guess, medical practitioner. Uh, the reason being is that uh, if you think about a doctor or a dentist, let's say, which are the two examples that are specifically mentioned, um, they almost always have support staff with them. Uh, so you have uh, administrative staff, you have a dental hygienist, uh, something like that. Uh, you often have multiple people like waiting at a time uh, in different rooms because you're jumping back and forth between exam rooms. Uh, whereas massage therapists are uh, in the home setting in that context are, are generally always like a, a sole proprietorship with no support. They, they almost always do all their own bookings, their own uh, administrative work. So you'd essentially be having uh, one person running the office and maybe seeing one person at a time as part of their home-based business setup. Uh, so we were asked to give consideration to them as, as being distinctly different from a, a standard medical office. Uh, and, uh, and, and I do feel that that's you know, reasonable to some extent. And, um, and to, to Councillor Champagne's point, uh, yes, if, if, if the massage therapist set up, uh, it would create some additional competition potentially. Uh, but we also don't want to walk out additional people looking to set up businesses necessarily. It's uh, it's just absolutely different. Uh, I'm just going to talk about it. Is just, I just feel that let's say you have a disgruntled employee that does massage therapy and not, not happy with the rules and regulation, decides I'm going to do my own, I'll take all the customers away and start my own. Mm -hmm. I would feel, I would not feel right about that. So that's one reason I'm saying that. Yeah, some bookkeepers that could happen. I mean, there's a lot of domains where that could happen. Where personally, I've never seen massage therapy as a medical service. I'm even surprised yeah. that it's qualified as that. I mean, do require. I I also feel like um, things like uh, professional services such as like counseling or social workers, mm -hmm. uh, those those often operate out of people's homes as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I see that as as more similar. Um, the the main concern was uh, was not having busier office set settings with multiple employees and and large scale parking mm -hmm. uh, in in people's homes. Uh, the the individual one on one type services without the administrative support cast. Uh, those are the ones that uh, that we're kind of talking about now. Um, but to that point, if I may, just currently, I mean, we do it is allowed. There are people operating in their homes, but we also have. I, I'm a, I'm a client of KRMP. I'm very proud to be for all my services. I go there and I think it's wonderful and I think they're doing very well. I get a sense and we've had an environment where we've it's been permissive and it's not hurt them. So I'm wondering why we would choose to be restricted. Now, when, when in general in these fairs, what we've tried to do is encourage home-based businesses. But I mean, I find Councillor Champagne is making a very valid point. We could make our medical center more competitive Although at this point, a massage therapy services is not uh, being contemplated in that facility. Could, could we in the future add to our, could we restrict in the future? We could add to it. Only, it's only by we could modify as we wish in the future. Uh, yes, we could. We could make any amendment we, we wanted within the framework of our official plan. But uh, in this context, we could make any changes, yeah. yeah. If people wanted to do spider if they want to do it themselves, they're going to do it. We, we're not going to stop them. I just don't want to be the one saying we allowed it to happen. That's all. Yes. Well, we're allowing it now, Councillor Champagne, and it's going on right now, and it's operating fine. And so, uh, we may get the op the office out of your thing, you know, in that sense. Uh, so, so, that is one thing I could add, actually, Mayor Rushford, is that it, it is currently permitted. And uh, the comment was actually about uh, the way our definition for medical office was worded to, to say that all health professionals that are regulated under the Ontario Act uh, counted as a medical office. So it was more that um, our definition was, had an unintended consequence of, of prohibiting things that are currently permitted. So our, our existing provisions do allow massage therapy to take place, which is part of the reason why, why you see those things around in people's homes. So. Um, so the way it's currently written, it, we would actually be um, restricting something that's currently allowed. Uh, so, so I guess that's the question that, that we need to, to answer is whether we, we do want to prohibit that. Uh, mm -hmm. And Henry's tried to book a massage. I just want to say it's like two months. Well, does that put two? <laughs> Wait, yeah. I've been trying forever. It's like February. <laughs> <laughs> I book weekly. <laughs> 
if you're an existing client. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yes, concrete. So that's <laughs> uh, quite frankly, there is provisions for massage therapy in the medical building. In fact, uh, it's not confidential because it's an open meeting, but uh, the uh, the chiropractor may be bringing one or two massage therapists. Yes, with he does have uh, well, okay. concur, concur. That's so, uh, you know, we'd be, we're, we're providing two official buildings, uh, one being adjacent to uh, our meeting here, yeah. and the other one over in the Astonville area, the new medical building. So, uh, and by, by allowing it, you're condoning it, basically. It's, uh, even though it's un, unlicensed, it's licensed through the province, not by the municipality. Yes. So I can see uh, Councillor Champagne's point again. Again, Greg's doing a great job. Is that he's not going to get the phone calls. We're going to be here. Uh, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, people are going to be saying we got these businesses to out of And we're trying to attract. Well, we're we're asking to, for yeah. sponsorship money instead of you know, for stuff. And they're going to say, well, yeah. go, go see them for sponsorship. <laughs> and I think myself, uh, I, I would like to restrict it to the medical buildings uh, as designated, uh, one being the one adjacent to us. That's just my opinion. And uh, if they find that uh, everything's full, because medical building, we're trying to attract, we're trying to make it as revenue neutral as possible. So, I mean, you know, if people can run out of their home, they could mostly rent an office uh, and then uh, and provide the services. Exactly. Hi, Councilor. Yeah, I think your agreement has support as well. Yeah. I, I guess so. yes. It's, we hadn't thought of the dimension. I don't think of the medical yeah. center. So, and in the future, we can change it because if we're going to get calls, we're going to get them now because we're restricting. So, I do, but that said, I mean, it is important to look out for a medical center and appreciate that concerns are valid ones. So, okay. So, in that case, uh, we will leave it as written, and uh, and it doesn't provide an exemption for those services. Okay. So, thank you, Councilor uh, Champagne, for making us more aware of the need for to, to support a medical center. Okay. So we are not, can you just clarify what we're doing again? We are not permitting this. Is that what we're doing? Correct. Yes. Out of a whole massage therapy. Uh, I'm not okay with it, so I'm going to say no. But that's, I respect you guys sure. for that 100%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I just, something about it's not sitting well with me because mm -hmm. of your comment earlier. But I, thanks for bringing it up. But well, we do still have to choose. Yeah, I do recognize that we want to have a final policy, but it does yeah. give us a chance to reflect on it further. Maybe if any yeah. of us have comments, we could direct them to you between now and Tuesday. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sure. And nothing gets these the, the people that's late. No. no. It's been an opportunity to rent a spot or you know, be, be in the front and center. Uh, I just have a problem with it getting too much, too uh, watered down. And next thing you know, the businesses that are already in place are going to start losing. That's the concern that I have. I fully agree with you. That's a valid concern. But I, my point is, it could be said about a lot of other businesses yes. in our community. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to like pinpoint on one. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I, you're right. I think you're right. Because it, you can, you can, you could branch this across. Yes. I, I do feel yes. like it does narrow it up a lot. Yes. I, I'm uncomfortable with it. I'm, I am. So we'll reflect on that. Yeah, I don't know. Well. Okay. It's good. Good. Okay, uh, so that that's uh, that's it from the changes that were made. Uh, I just have two additional things to cover from Planning Committee's resolution, and then one more section to talk about the bylaw, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the Table Five B, which is our residential setbacks, uh, <coughs> we made a recommendation at our last Planning Committee that we just clarify. Uh, the lot coverage provisions for uh, farms and hobby farms and mobile home parks. Uh, that uh, it basically um, the lot coverage provision for farms and hobby farms. Uh, we just clarified that that applies only to buildings and structures and not farmers' fields. Uh, so we we obviously don't want to limit a farmer's field to a ten percent lot coverage, or else that doesn't make their farm very effective. So that was added. And then there was a clarification made uh, to the lot coverage uh, for mobile home parks, uh, just to match it with uh, uh, with the other similar zoning. Uh, so that, that was previously not included. So those those were the final two items from the planning committee resolution. Just a quick question, Mr. Prince. Have any of our uh, larger farm owners uh, provided comments to you? Uh, I have not received any comments from any of the farms. 
But our, our farming provisions have remained largely unchanged and, and they seem to be working. We, we haven't had any compliance issues with any of the farms or, or anything that's preventing them from, uh, from doing anything that they want to do. So I, I think it is working for the farms. <laughs> I think we're done with three or four, aren't we? We don't want that many. Not that many, no. But we want to keep the ones we have. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the final thing that I have to touch on, which we didn't speak about at our last council meeting, is uh, section 10. So uh, this was sent out an email, but uh, it's uh, this, this large document here, which is our special zones. Uh, so what the special zones are, uh, is basically a compilation of all of the zoning bylaw amendments that have been passed by council uh, under bylaw 1284, which is the existing zoning bylaw. Uh, so these have all remained unchanged. Uh, these are just highlighting the provisions and permissions that have been granted by council uh, up until this point. Uh, and uh, it, it's a, it was a huge amount of work. So a big thank you to Carrie and Jaden in the office for uh, the help uh, transcribing these. Uh, Many of them were, were typewriter only copies from the 70s and 80s and things like that. So uh, that was that was a very big job. So big thank you to them. Uh, but uh, the special zones are basically just carrying forward existing permissions that uh, the council has granted in the past. And uh, I will continue to add to these as we get new uh, site specific applications. And, and don't get me wrong, Greg, this is great work. So you know, anytime I make comments, it's like, I like playing the devil's advocate sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's stuff that I hear about and I think I'll buy it for it. But yeah. this is an excellent job. Great work for you and staff. Oh, thank you. You were expecting to I, 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 I was expecting to pull up. I was expecting to pull up. You guys are surprised. <laughs> I realize it's a lot of work, but it's the stuff that I talk about is the stuff that I hear in the background. So I bring it back more because people are, are talking about it. Yeah, no. We're the ones going to hear about it. Anything that I've said, yeah. we're going to hear about it. So. Yeah. No, it's I need to apologize for bringing up that points. Like, I think it's no, I, yeah. just for Greg, I think he yeah. thinks I'm beating up on it. No, I, I don't I at all. Uh, here is the time and place to talk about these things. And it's, uh, it's better to do it now mm -hmm. before we pass it than have to go back and look at it later. So I'd say it's, it's definitely time. No, you guys read it up and down. You guys sit on planning. I don't. Only mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. So I, it's a lot to take in. It yep. is, oh, it is. There's a few more questions a lot before oh. the end. But I mean, it, and 99% of it, I agree with. So. Good. Well, can I come to the uh, One thing that really did has come out in the last I think five years is the fact that, and uh, quite frankly, a lot of people don't realize how important it is because once a developer approaches the property to develop it and it's already in the official plan, if council doesn't approve the development and, and they've crossed all the T's and dotted the I's, we could be, uh, we could be sued as a municipality and correctly so because they follow the official plan and it's in place. So, and I see uh, we've got uh, different things going on in the municipality. You know, uh, little 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 people signing this and that document, but no idea that if it's in the official plan, it's basically written in stone. So it makes it difficult. But that's why it's so important. That's why, quite frankly, as far as feedback goes, I've had a lot of feedback on my section where I'm living and people I see and can meet up with about the provisions on small lots. Because they can't, some of them couldn't build a garage, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah, so, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Councilor Kelly. Now, uh, now's the time to, to take a very close look at it. And we've had a comprehensive process because once mm -hmm. it's been in here, it's, uh, it's yeah. harder to go back to change it. So. But we do get, if there's going to be a problem, we'll get feedback before anybody else. Mm -hmm. Is that something? Rick is ready. I just have to go get on. Nope. I sure. think we're at the end. We're at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're at the end. We're not trying to rush you. Nope. I just no. have to yeah, but we do have just the resolution. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's. Uh, if everyone's yeah, okay, we're able. Could you conclude? Could you conclude? Well, I think those sure. comments were. <laughs> yes, let's conclude. Okay. So okay, okay. yes, go for uh, Great. Did you have anything added to the resolution? Uh, the only things that I wanted to add to the resolution were uh, to remove the commercial vehicle uh, provision that we spoke about at the start, the limitation on parking okay. residential okay. areas, okay. Uh, and then also to add the 15% uh, lot coverage. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh,
put Irish wire remover in the second year, and by Councilor Mahid and seconded by Councilor Chapin. Whereas Council for the Municipality of Leeds Harris has reviewed the comprehensive zoning bylaw in detail and is satisfied with its final presentation, be it hereby resolved that the comprehensive zoning bylaw be referred to the Council agenda for the regular meeting of December 14, 2021, for the approval of passing first, second, and third reading with the removal of commercial vehicle provision in residential and add 15% lot coverage per lot below two acres. Uh, on favor? No? Okay, Carrie, thank you. Um, with that said, uh, we are good to proceed with the uh, adjournment. We were at seconder, so moved by Councillor Chapin and Councillor Kelly that we do now adjourn this meeting at 2.33 p.m.